Today, I'm very excited to be joined by uh, the co-founders of Jack Black's Brewing Company, Megan and Ross McCulloch. Uh, they have joined us today to talk about uh, the status of Jack Black, where they are right now in the midst of coronavirus, but also future plans, and to learn a bit more about the company. So first of all, uh, Megan and Ross, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So you're joining us. We're recording this in the beginning of May 2020, and I feel like we should we should start every recording with that, um, so people in history can remember that this is an odd time uh, in the history of the world. So uh, you have a brewing company, you're a craft brewery. Uh, we are now currently in stage four, which we know very well. In the future, they may look back on this and wonder what happened, but we're in stage four. There's still an alcohol ban in place in South Africa. Uh, I'm curious about how uh, COVID-19 and the associated lockdowns have impacted uh, Jack Black Brewing Company. You know, with, the, with an uh, absolute ban, we've had to stop uh, cease production. Um, we had uh, emergency uh, services. Uh, we had a, a license to um, or an approval to service our equipment within the brewery. So we've had uh, one brewer go in every day to maintain the equipment that we have so that when we do, um, you know, eventually come out of lockdown and are able to go back to production that, you know, the, the equipment hasn't seized up or rusted or anything like that. So there is maintenance function that we have, but that's uh, pretty much it from the production side. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we have been, the folks who are, you know, sitting at home, uh, you know, they, they, are, they are busy thinking about different uh, processes, uh, different ways of working. So we have been working, uh, even though not at work, uh, on how to improve and what we should do, uh, what actions we should take when, you know, when we do get back to production. Our marketing team has been very yeah. busy. Megan has been very busy uh, with her team, you know, getting ready for, for uh, lockdown to end. Yeah, and I think um, I, officially I'm the marketing director at, at the business as well. And I think that, um, you know, we have, well, we haven't stopped, you know, the, the, the brewery might uh, be running dry, but uh, as Ross said, people did sort of stock up a little bit before the lockdown. And um, we're very much a, a community-based brand and our community is still out there. So we are still very engaged in social media um, and online with our community. And um, that's been a pleasure because they've been um, super supportive of us during this time. And um, yeah, there's lots of other ways that we can interact um, without doing the events. We're also a very events-based company. So that's also hit us quite hard is that we're, we're not able to, to have those events um, or sell our, our beer in restaurants, you know, of course. So Yeah. Well, so that's yeah. an interesting, I think both of you touched on this is sort of the, the market is going to change now. We're, we're going to, whenever we come out of this lockdown, it's going to be a, a, a different market, a different space, a different world. So, um, you know, you talked about events, that's even when they allow events, there might be some hesitance about that. Um, so how you market those, how do you go to those? So I'm curious about what are the big changes do you think you'll see in the market that you're going to sort of re-enter into? It won't be the same as, as when we went into lockdown originally. You know, one of the one of the challenges that we face is that, uh, and with a lot of other craft brewers in the country, we sell uh, primarily to our restaurant customers or on trade customers, and um, that's where the bulk of our volume is sold. So uh, compared to the bigger breweries who s sell a vast majority of their product through the the off off trade or off consumption uh, side of the business, so it's going to affect us quite significantly. As I said earlier. That Restaurants, we don't see, for see, uh, we don't see them opening up uh, for the next few months. Um, and when they do open up, they'll probably, looking at what's happen, happening on a global scale, they'll open up tentatively. Um, you know, there won't be, there'll, there'll be restrictions in place in terms of operating hours, number of people in restaurants. So, again, the, the bulk of our business is going to, is going to dry up um, or, uh, or be, uh, really be affected. So the smaller part of our business, which is the off, uh, off trade or the, the retail side, is an area that we are really brainstorming and working on how we can uh, in, in improve or increase our presence in the area of the business um, yeah. mm. to get beer into homes. Exactly. Mm. I was just going to say that that's sort of a focus for us is the home environment now and, and how you'll enjoy and interact with the brand from a home environment versus 
We also have a restaurant as well at the brewery. Um, it's quite a large restaurant, our tap room. So that's that's also something that we're going to have to sort of reinvent in this, mm. um, you know, lack of a better term, this new normal that we're all going to be faced with. And um, yeah, again, um, we do uh, something called a growler, which is a refillable 1.9 liter container that people can take home. So that's like a nice innovation um, to think about people enjoying that draft experience at home. So programs right. around that. Um, we're also going to be really excited to launch a home delivery program. So that's something that we've never offered before. But um, from a brand side as well, we're really excited to be able to offer our customers um, a little more than you would if you were ordering from maybe some more purchase on national retailers. We're, we'll do it a little in a, a little bit more of a Jack Black. And, you know, we've, we've seen that model happening overseas quite a bit. Um, and it's a nice way that we can pivot a little bit and also offer employment to some of our people that are, we're working in a different area of the business, you know? Right. Well, so that's, I think it's an interesting bit that sort of leads into the next questions around, you know, outside of global pandemics, which let's set to one side for one moment. Um, you know, what are the challenges? This is a, you know, Jack Black has, has been a craft beer. Uh, it, it is a craft beer. So what are the challenges of starting a craft brewery in South Africa specifically? Are there specific aspects of South African market or environment that made it easier, harder, more challenging? Um, you know, back when we started in 2007, uh, you know, the, it, it was a very under, undeveloped craft beer market. So uh, back in 2007, it was primarily a, a situation of education uh, about craft beer and what we stand for and what we do. And it, it's ongoing until today. You know, it's, it's going to be an ongoing, uh, um, you know, philosophy of, of ours to educate our consumers about our beers and how we make them and, and our stories, which is often how we sell our beers. So back then, they didn't know too much about craft beer. Um, the other challenges that we've had, um, you know, in this particular market are uh, primarily that we've got um, a couple of really big uh, beer producers. And in South Africa, uh, these producers make beer for some of the, the, some of the cheapest beer in the world. Um, they can, and those downward pressures in terms of uh, pricing um, is, is a real challenge for us to, uh, to have, you know, the margins that, you know, we require to build our business. So those were some of the, particularly in the beginning, are some of the real challenges uh, is, is a pricing challenge within the market. Um, right. So we generally price quite a lot higher than, you know, most of the, the, the mainstream beers in the marketplace. And so the consumer is a bit reluctant, um, you know, to, to jump on board. But very often when they do, you know, they become quite loyal, which is great. Yeah, we, we have a new tagline at the brewery um, for the brand, which is that it's more than just a beer. And that's been really important um, to try and educate people, like Ross said, um, but to, to also for them to feel a part of a community, a part of a craft community, and to, to understand that what they're, what they're buying into by buying our product is more than just the liquid. Um, it's the opposite of having people see beer as like a commodity. You know, we want it to be a special, something special. It's an occasion that you'll celebrate with friends or family or even, you know, just on a regular Wednesday night. But um, we really need to, as a marketing team, elevate that occasion um, so that people will actually, like Ross is saying, fork out that extra 10 or 15, 20 rand um, for a Jack Black. Right. Well, so that's a, so. Are these the you know same challenges you think that would happen internationally? Are these uniquely South African, or are these sort of the challenges that craft breweries will face in many countries? Um, I think uh, it, in the US, which is quite a developed market, there've been uh, you know craft beer has been growing there since the early '80s. Um, the consumers there have an intr intrinsic; they've got more disposable income. They have uh, they have an intrinsic desire to understand uh, you know more the, about the products that they consume um, and so they're looking for those stories they're looking for that uniqueness while in South Africa is, you know a, a lot of our consumers um, are, are more driven by um, aspirational uh, kind of um, marketing uh, versus the real stories behind the brands um, and you know we don't have the, that kind of marketing power you know, to talk about aspiration and, and so on and so forth. So we, we just talk about our stories um, and, and uh, you know, that, that can sometimes fall on deaf ears because, you know, folks don't, you know, they, they, um, they're just trying to survive, you know. <laughs> and, right. Uh, and, um, 
and so that those are again the, the challenges that we we face in other markets um, you know they, they do of course have their own challenges um, but uh, but they seem to have a, a much broader consumer base um, uh, very often and uh, are able to um, crop brewers very often in these kind of markets also be able to innovate a lot more um, and and create sales that way uh, we found that uh, we, while we have innovated and we continue to innovate, we need to keep that innovation in check uh, um, because it falls, again, it, it doesn't, um, it's not uh, really, uh, can I say, um, like relevant for a lot of the consumers. And uh, so we really need to keep, even though we want to come out with a double hopped IPA with this, that and the other, um, uh, we, we have to go, you know, is, we have to validate it and, and look at where the craft beer market, uh, you know, and what category is at this, at this current time. Yeah, um, mm. yeah we, have to, we have to really control our innovation to get yeah. through while in other markets they can often go crazy. And, and that's, yeah. that's not just an education piece, but it's also a palate piece. People's mm. palates, you know, if you're not used to drinking those kinds of beers, it's I come from a wine background and it's the same thing. Everyone starts with a really sweet rosé wine and then, you know, they, they down the track of your tannins, they become, you know, you'll, you'll acclimatize almost to, a, to a, um, almost a bitter red wine and then that sort of becomes your mainstay. But we need to be very aware of where people's palates are at um, and still stay true to the brand. Um, not to digress too much, but our... our initial beer that we launched with was our Jack Black pre-prohibition lager style and we chose a beer because we felt it was really interesting and different and still had a lot of those craft characteristics to it but it was accessible to the market and relevant to the market yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's really interesting so I think one of the you know one of the issues we talk about that uh, sort of the trends in what's acceptable in one space versus another so so one of the trends um, certainly I've seen on social media and thus uh, a bunch of media reporting about it in, in some countries is this um, low alcohol or no alcohol trending for a younger generation. So I'm curious if that's, um, if you feel like that's made its way to South Africa, um, if you feel like that's something that you are either going to have low alcohol beer or no alcohol beer, or it's something you're not thinking about. I'm just curious about if that's, that's sort of on your radar. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> We we talk about it quite a lot. Um, one the most one of the most important things that you know the longevity of our co of our company and our brand is to do what's true to the brand. So we don't just respond to any trend that's happening in the marketplace and just jump on on things. You know, one of the things that I think have made us successful or be in business at least be in business for the last you know close to thirteen years is actually being able to say no to certain things and. Um, that, that is really important uh, not to jump on everything. Otherwise, you just, uh, there's not enough focus. So the, you know, we, we, we are talking about a lot. We really um, understand and appreciate uh, low alcohol products. Uh, people, are, you know, the, the way the world is moving, you just don't want to wake up with a, a hangover anymore. It's not cool. It's not the right thing to do. You know, when, when I was young, yeah, that was kind of what we did. But uh, now it's, you know, you, you, you got to be game on. And, and I think the, the youth of today, uh, really appreciate that. So these products are, um, are are definitely on our radar. We're interested in in zero alcohol. Um, it's quite a quite a capital investment to get uh, uh, you know zero alcohol product that tastes good. And our mm. our products, the craft beer, is often focused on flavor uh, and innovation and uniqueness. Um, so so to to make a good non-alcoholic beer is is uh, can be quite expensive. Uh, but, you know, we, we have responded with our Cape Pale Ale, uh, which is, uh, you know, 4% alcohol product like Castle Light and also our lowest calories, so close to 100 calories, um, just a bit over. Yeah. So it's light compared to our other products, yeah. but it's very flavorful and very distinct and nice hop character. Uh, we don't communicate about it, talk about it a lot, but it's something, you know, we are looking to do. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I don't to interject, but we, the, the Cape Pale Ale existed even these sort of trends came to the to the forefront so it's kind of like we had a product in our staple that can check some of those boxes and it's about how do we communicate that to people in a way like Ross said true to the brand um that that skew in particular represents um uh the great outdoors and fullness in flavor and um it's uh, also a sense of place in terms of the cape pale ale so 
we feel that for that consumer, it is, it's, it's very interesting to them. You know, they can go, go there with a lighter, lighter tasting um, and lighter in calorie. But yeah, we, that's not our first message as a brand. We don't feel it would feel right for Jack Black. Right. Well, so that's really interesting. So I think you, you've both touched on, on a key issue here, or a, a balancing act, if you will, of quality. It's, it's really hard to make something as easy, you know, that tastes good. It's easy to make a, a no alcohol, well, not easy, but you know, relatively easy to make a no alcohol beer. Uh, how do we make one that actually tastes good? So th there's a balance of quality, but also variety. There, there's all these different tastes, all these different, uh, you know, markets. So how have you, in building the brand, how have you tried to balance, you know, getting things that you produce to be really good and high quality, but also producing enough variety um, that you're not in such a niche market that, you know, if, if things move by 1%, you're in real trouble? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, you know, the... Uh, our lager that we've talked about has got, uh, you know, has got some nice, some fantastic characteristics that are unique and, and differentiated from other mainstream lagers, and that has been our staple and our, you know, our flagship product, uh, you know, since inception, since day one. Um, and I think what's what's really important uh, for uh, for any brewery is to have uh, high quality uh, and consistency. Um, you, you you cannot forego those. You you know you can't overlook that, and particularly in in, in consumer beer consumers. You know, you want the beer to taste the same every time, unlike wine very often where, you know, one harvest or one, one season is different to the next, one vintage is different to the next, and that's fine and understandable. Uh, but, you know, for beer, consistency is, is key. But, over, you know, we have that direct over the years, small changes. It is quite, it's quite straightforward to make a good beer, but to make a great beer requires at last 5% of tweaking we've done we continue to do through a lot of trial, a lot of tasting, which is, of course, the fun part, uh, and, and really understanding our products and getting feedback from our consumers in our tap room when it was open. We'd get a lot of feedback on yeah. products in that tap room, uh, in the tap room too. So, you know, we'd ha we have thought we, we had thousands of people coming in every month trying different products, and we'd get fantastic feedback on that. So we also, another, you know, another thing where a lot of our marketing, and Meg can speak better to this than I can, but a lot of our marketing is based on, um, you know, uh, innovation and things that we can talk about. So we have, without, you know, without completely committing huge budgets and, and uh, um, towards products, we, we do things that we call uh, limited releases. So three times a year, uh, we release a, a different, unique beer in a small volume, um, you know, 300 cases, for example. And once it's uh, once it's sold out, it's sold out. And we can, and you know, marketing has the opportunity to speak to our consumers, provide something completely unique. So we do a fresh hop IPA in at the end of February or March, and then we do a, a, a oatmeal stout in the middle of the year in June in winter. And then we'll do a, what we call a mega ale, one of our biggest, strongest beers uh, in December. And we only, like I said, only make about 300 cases of each. And that, that stuff sells out quick. Mm -hmm. So you kind of mm -hmm. keep the communication, keep the stories coming, uh, you know, the backstories, keep those yeah. coming and, and it helps. It's also really exciting for our brewers because, you know, our brewers do want to get their hands dirty and play with different ingredients. And um, they don't just want to be pushing a button, you know, that's going to make the same sort of recipe over and over again, as important as that is. Yeah. Um, but also on another, on another way of innovating is we've also been innovating through packaging. So you don't necessarily need to, you know, have new recipes and new styles of beers to innovate in our industry. We launched a 440 can um, last year of our Jack Black Lager. So that was really exciting for us. And that's, that's kind of the way forward of craft beer is in can. Um, the beer is protected from light. It's less expensive. It's more environmentally friendly. And then we also renovated all of packaging across the entire brand. So um, you'll notice on shelf now it comes in a paper wrap and we're saving over 10 tons of plastic annually. So we do have a pillar of sustainability within the business. So I think you also need to keep in mind, you know, innovating with the times as well. Um, unfortunately, it took us a little while to get here because there was a big co cost implication, which we absorbed in the brewery, but it was really important for us to um, have a stand at. So other ways of innovating as well, beyond just your own. Right. 
So that, that's really interesting. So I, I think that, you know, this, this innovation, I had another question just quickly about um, how do you know when you're onto a winning recipe for, for a new beer? So I, you answered a bit of that. Is it, do you make it available in the tap room and it, you know, before it goes on sale, do you, uh, is, do you leave it up to the brewers? Is, is it down to your taste buds as the two of you to, to, to sip in the house uh, or, or what's the final decision on? Yes, this is one. <laughs> no, you know, like, um, yeah, we I, I, we do release some of it in the tap room, um, but you know it has to be it has to be eighty ninety percent of the way there first um, right. before we do anything like that. Uh, we we not making complete uh, you know uh, guinea pigs out of our customers. Um, you know we and and if there's something that we really like um, and I really like, we'll be like okay, let's go, and then we we just then we go for it. And, and of course, what you know what the brewers like. Um, but you know we must be very careful about uh, about you know we've been we've been drinking craft beer for a much, lot longer than most other folks, so we really need to understand um, our consumers and kind of find a, a not a compromise but a a sweet spot that works for our consumers and for us mm. um, and and not just you know again otherwise we'd be you know I, I prefer I love IPAs but it's you know one of the smallest selling beers within our portfolio. Um, and it's a great IPA. It's an award-winning IPA, but it just, you know, in, in South Africa, um, it, 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 it that traction yet, you know, even though yeah. IPA is the long beer style in the United States, it's really small here in South Africa. So we, we really do take those, you know, take that understanding uh, in, into the development of our products. Mm. Well, and can, can I go back a bit to this question then? So, you know, you mentioned at the beginning about, uh, you know, again, the people who are working there, it's obviously not just a two person operation there to, to brew craft beer. Um, what do you think has been the key to building a team of people that has allowed you to be successful since 2007? I mean, it's a long run now. We're talking 13 years. Um, what were the keys to building that team of people um, that has allowed you to, to innovate as you've been talking about to grow um, to make sure you're meeting the market needs and all of that. So how, how have you done that over time? Um, I'll start, but I'm, we both, I mean, both of us are co-founders. We both work within the business. And, you know, um, I, think, I think it starts with our absolute passion for the business. Um, like, we really love it. Um, you know, it, it makes us go gray, as you can see. And, and there's a lot of stress and a lot, but we do love what we do. And, you know, our team... Our teams, I think, see that. Um, uh, they see that we love what we do. Um, we have a fantastic brand, um, and we have, you know, we, we conduct our business ethically. Uh, we keep our principles in place, and then the, the, our teams, they, they follow that, they appreciate that, and, and they really believe in what we're doing. And I think they also love craft beer themselves, most of them. Um, and, and so it's really nice to have a beer at the end of the week or at the end of the day and kind of really experience the fruits of your labor. Um, so, yeah, a lot, of our, a lot of our staff, which have been with us for a long time, um, you know, they, you know they, they love the industry, they love the brand, they believe in the brand. And, um, and I think they also believe in the culture of our business, which the, the culture is Meg and I, and, and we are the culture of the business and we, um, yeah. we're not corporate, uh, but we, we take our work seriously. Um, mm. and they are, they are the culture as well. I mean, mm. our, our pyramidal structure is, is quite flat, you know, sometimes too flat, mm. but, um, but it's very much a cooperative work environment. And, um, I think also, um, like Ross was saying, because many of our staff have been with us since inception and we, we did start this business on a shoestring. Um, you can't sort of take that away. You know, this wasn't a multi-million rand startup. Um, Ross was literally delivering beer on a scooter and I was making phone calls. So um, even though we've grown since they, then, you know, it's still kind of in our DNA. And when people start a job, we, we always tell them, you know, that story. And, and they, love, they love feeling like an entrepreneur within, within the business. And we allow that, you know? Mm. No, I think that's really interesting. I think that that growth, but main, you know, you, you become a bigger business and it is sort of um, how do we keep some of that innovative roots that, that helped us start at the beginning, I think is really important. Um, one final question I always like to, to end with sort of a future thinking question. So at the risk of generating more competition for you, uh, I'm curious about what advice would you have for people who are thinking about 
moving into this space, into the microbrewery space. Um, you know, what tips or guidance would you give them? Obviously, don't sell what you're selling. Don't compete with Jack Black. But other than that, what, what advice would you give for someone that wants to start in this space? Um, I, as I mentioned in our, in our first, um, you know, in, in a couple of minutes ago, was you have to have an absolute passion for the business. Um, it's, it's definitely not a get rich quick, uh, scheme. I mean, it was in the United, uh, you know, admittedly it was in the United States a few years ago, back in, you know, in 2015, you know, 7,000 breweries ought have opened up in the U S and a lot of folks were making uh, a good amount of money, but you know, it, it really is, it's not a get rich quick scheme it, you have to have real passion for what you do and the business of beer, not just drinking beer. You actually have to have a real uh, insight and, and also want to be out and be part of the community. Beer is very um, a community-based type product. Um, and, and if you, you, know, you want to work just behind your desk, um, you, that makes it more challenging. You've got to get out there and understand your consumer. I also say, you know, because I've been approached a few times by folks, you know, wanting to get into the business and they want to kind of get this insight. But um, you really need to go and chat to people uh, such as myself or, or Meg or, or other brewers and understand how they've done it or not done it um, and, and yeah. get a, a real a, a grassroots understanding um, because a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of folks who start a beer business don't have any idea of how much hard work it is. You know, they think it's a couple of beers and some high fives and everybody wants your product. Um, so, yeah, the, it's, it is quite challenging. So be, be, be a, a community-driven person. Be very passionate about your business. Find out, ask a lot of questions of the existing brewers in the marketplace. Uh, and also focus. Um, I think a lot of people get very excited about launching a whole bunch of innovative, interesting beers, but they, they, they can lose that focus. Um, and, and, uh, and, and then it kind of starts falling short um, if they don't, you know, focus on the right products um, for their community or for their market. Um, and I think that's, that focus is, again, one of the, the big things. Like, again, going back to say no to a lot of things and rather just focus on what works. And very often you tend to focus on what works, in, uh, you know, um, anyway because you have no money a lot of the time. So you have to focus on what works. You can't, um, you know, you, you don't have the budget to go and uh, do crazy, you know, marketing campaigns that will fall short anyway. You've got to focus mm. on just the right stuff. Um, right. Well, on the note too about focusing, I mean, we, we've become a national brand, but um, there's a lot of merit um, still in, in, in being more local, you know, and I see a lot of successful companies. And if I were to do this again, I would definitely consider that is that um, like Ross said, your community is really your market and there's other brewers also in South Africa and they're not really interested in the other provinces. They just want to, they want to supply the local market. They want to supply it really well. They have amazing beers. They can focus on that innovation because they're not trying to worry about distribution, which mm -hmm. was a big headache for us for most of the, you know, the lifetime of the business was how do we get beer to people? So we spent a lot of time on, we have a distribution no. side of the business, which, which was a, a real challenge and remains, um, Remains yeah. so. So um, big, being big, you know, isn't necessarily being great. No. So I think that's even moving into the next decade. I think people are really going to consider what is a great business. And, you know, it's not just about size and, and revenue, as we all know. Um, yeah. It's also yeah. about experience and quality. So, yeah. yeah, I think that I think what, uh, you know, to reiterate what Meg says and kind of back that up and, and uh, particularly post, uh, post COVID, um, you know, I think people will be more focused on their communities they will uh, hopefully want to support uh, s small local businesses, um, and and I, and 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 it's no different for beer. You know, if you if you look at how large the beer category is, um, you know, our even our brewery, which is a bit bigger than than most uh, other craft brewers in the country, you know, if, if everybody in in uh, the southern suburbs of Cape Town decided to drink Jack Black as their beer of choice, we would definitely run out of capacity. Um, so you know that that's how how big beer actually is. So if you can just if you open up a, a, a small brewery in Musenberg and you get everybody in Musenberg to drink your beer, you'll have a very you know profitable business, and you won't have to worry so much about logistics. I mean, we did right. it. We did it initially because we we had to because it was early days. I was very reluctant to go to go to Kauteng. Um, eventually, did and we paid for it because we kept on running out of stock at that time. 
and I had a lot of irate customers and I was paying, we were paying huge, you know, uh, logistics uh, uh, costs. So there, 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 there was those challenges, but we, we, we did go that route. And, and, you know, today Gauteng is, is about the same size as the Western Cape in terms of volumes. But again, that, uh, going back to that point is, you know, f- focus on small, focus on, and then when, when the business gets to that next level, then take the next step. If you want to. Um, don't spread yourself mm. too thin, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, the usual thing is always going to, there's, there's no magic button for cash flow, um, you know. So there's all that, that, that kind of stuff, which I'm sure all your, all your students are very uh, familiar with. That's another class altogether. That's another class altogether is cash flow. But <laughs> Megan and Ross McCulloch, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been really interesting to learn uh, about, you know, the, the path of Jack Black Brewing and how it's sort of grown and developed, how you're, you know, you've built, as you said, you've built yourself into a very big brand, but also trying to keep that innovation, keep that dynamic, uh, dynamism involved in the, that dynamic approach. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Best of luck during these very difficult times of COVID-19 and lockdowns. Um, it's great to hear that you've got some plans for post-lockdown and, and best of luck of that. So again, thank you so much for joining us and passing on some insights. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much, Tim. Pleasure.